there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. You have one saved voice message. Hey, what's up? Um, I'm down here in LA, just chilling. I guess somebody wrote a piece for it that I'm dead, but I'm not dead. And um, I'm not dead, and they wrote a police report that I am dead. So I'm, I guess I'm no longer myself. I will talk to you later. Anyways, the car was on the freeway, windows down, keys in the front seat of the car, his skateboard in the car. He's having a mental breakdown, talking to himself in front of a church. Maybe that felt like a safe spot, I don't know. And he's talking to himself and he's doing sit-ups in the street and he's out of his mind. And Ruben is driving home to 12.30 at night. Doesn't want to get out of the car, but he's concerned, so he calls 911. And you never call 911. <laughs> they approach Bobby, they surrounded Bobby. One officer had a taser. So then the sergeant yells out to go hands on. That order was given to Vanessa Rejo when asked in the deposition, well, why hadn't you tasered him? Because he hadn't been aggressive. And so she had holstered her weapon because it states when you go hands-on that you are to have your weapon holstered. Makes sense. So Vanessa goes to handcuff Bobby. Officer Stewart steps in between her and Bobby. He has his weapon drawn. I guess they had ordered Bobby to roll over, but he instead starts to stand up. And as he starts to stand up, Officer Stewart shot Bobby, as he said, center mass, which means he headed straight for the chest. And he shot Bobby, center mass, in the chest, and then he shot him in the back as he was falling to the ground. Hi. Hi, police um, police, sir. Um, I have um, the creepy, almost guy that looks like Jesus, his name's Kelly, roaming the parking lot, looking in cars, pulling on handles again. Okay, the train station was side of the train, or train station is young. Um, directly in front of Slide Bar, next to the bus station. February 8th, 2014. A month earlier, Officer Manuel Ramos and Corporal Jay Cincinnelli of the Fullerton Police Department were acquitted of all charges stemming from a confrontation with Kelly Thomas on July 5th, 2011. Which one is it? Put your fucking hand on me. Would you just fucking... Would you just fucking... All right! Put your hands on me. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground. Kelly said I'm sorry 15 times and called for his father 31 times. Eventually, he was taken to UC Irvine Medical Center and declared comatose on arrival. I'm oh, sorry, dude! He's on something. He went on a flight over there and we found him over He was on something. An autopsy performed after Kelly was removed from life support five days later revealed that no, he wasn't. The focus of the trial shifted away from the officers to Kelly himself. Kelly's death was blamed on a heart condition and not the six police officers that killed him. After Ramos and Cincinnati were found not guilty on January 13, 2014, charges were dropped against a third officer, Joseph Wolf. It wasn't just an outrage because the officers got off. It was an outrage because it was a message that police officers could now get away with murder. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. I just knew that I wanted to be there. 
and then a man named Reuben asks if I've ever heard of a kid named Bobby Henning. Ten three one, any available Paramount unit? Any available Paramount unit, Altac? Any available Paramount unit, your Altac? I can't believe you guys now. Tell me what you think, sir. From what I see? Yeah. We'll tell it to the judge. You want, I got to call the old lady. You okay, mind? no, 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 I don't mind. Would you mind if while you're calling? You, I, I was a wannabe cop. I was getting talked into going into the academy, and I started to be a ride along with a police officer, a sergeant. I seen bodies and deaths at that time, and it kind of drew me away from that. I used to have an admiration for them, but not anymore. Not after what they went and did. They said that his car broke down somewhere out there by the uh, 710 freeway. How he got over here, I do not know. He was on his way to Oklahoma, from what I hear. He has a little girl. 22 years old, on his way to go see his daughter. That's all he was going to do, go see his daughter. And he was on his way, and this was his last stop right here. When I seen him, I seen the, his clothes laying on the side of the road. This man's got to be drunk because there's a bar right there in the corner. So I said to myself, you better call 911 because this might be a carjacking. You never know what it's going to be. I guess he's intoxicated or whatever he was. He, was laying back. he would lay back and he would get on his knees and he would lay back. I'm a pretty good sized guy, you know, I could have, I could have handled him, you know, but, but I didn't do that. I, I kicked myself in the ass for it. I should have. So next thing I know, here comes police from every direction, from behind me and in front of me. I immediately, I said to myself, they're going to kill this guy. And they were just coming in. And they were just, it came up to him like this. They were all locking and loading. Did he look like he was taking a fighting stance or an aggressive stance? No. You hear this all the time. Well, he had a gun. Well, he had this, he had that. Well, I don't believe the cops anymore. I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. The cop that shot him came over next to me in between the squad car and my truck. And he's over here huffing and puffing like he's out of breath. And I asked the officer, why did you shoot him? And he looks up at me all surprised. He says, he went for my gun. I say, you're a damn liar. He didn't go for your gun. I seen the whole thing from right here. The two year anniversary of Bobby Henning's death was coming up. His parents live in Auburn, in Northern California, and they were coming down for a candlelight vigil. I think our loved ones that we have lost, the justice we're gonna get, is somewhere down the line, someone is not gonna have to join us. When we drive down the freeway about 20 minutes from our home, and I've done this for years, I just always have, we go by the hospital, I say, here's where Bobby was born, way to stay in my life. Well, here's where Bobby was murdered. rally was scheduled for the next day in Downey, a suburb outside Los Angeles. That's Terry Thaxton, the sister of Michael Nida. That's Jean, Michael's mother. Michael Nida was my baby. I had four children and I wanted another one. And it just so happened that my nephew and his girlfriend got pregnant. It didn't work out, the relationship didn't work out, and I was in the delivery room when he was born. Sometimes people would say to me, why do you take in another kid? You have enough kids. And I said, because everybody deserves to be somebody's baby. And love does not divide, it multiplies. Michael Nida was out on a date with his wife when a robbery occurred nearby. 911, what is your emergency? My daughter just called me right now. She's at Bank of America in Downey on Imperial. And two guys with guns um, approached her. The independent witnesses, they were all wearing dark hoodies, all black clothes. When the police saw Michael running across the street, 
They thought he was a suspect. The suspects were wearing black clothes, and Michael Nida was not. 38, I got one running from me. 38, he's a male Hispanic wearing a plaid long sleeve shirt. Mike left my house at about 7.20. By a quarter to eight, his wife's called me on the phone telling me, they shot him, they shot him, he's down on the ground, they shot him. I'm thinking, what, what, who? Michael, they shot him. Who shot him, Neely? The police, they shot him. Uh, I got a phone call from my mom screaming, and I couldn't understand her. And she said, he's been shot. I said, who? And she said, Michael. You know, the, the news people kept asking, was he a criminal? Was he in a gang? Uh, they're saying he robbed someone. And we all said, no, we don't have criminals in our family. We have cops in our family. The lie that they came up with the night that Michael was killed is that he turned in an aggressive manner. Gilly is the one who fired the MP5 and a bullet went across the street and hit the barbershop. Why did the cop have a submachine gun? He shot my son in the back. Even though he knew my son did not have a weapon, he knew that. Here's my car, Mom. Here's the snow. It's been two, two and a half years now. It's been tough, especially for his kids. You know, his son um, played football and basketball. Michael was his coach. And uh, his son didn't want to play sports anymore. You know, we've connected with a lot of families. We know Oscar Grant's family. We know Ernest Duenas' family. When there's a shooting, we try to connect with new families. And we, you know, just go out and give them a hug and tell them, I'm sorry. Welcome to the family. Of course, police brutality isn't limited to Los Angeles. Shoot back at the cops with your cameras. You thought I was going to say a gun. But shoot back at them with your camera. You have the right to film. Say, officer, I have a camera. Thank you for calling the Fall River Police Department. Hi, I'm going to jail. That's okay. I can videotape anywhere. Uniform Mello. Hi, Officer Mello. I got somebody out. I wrote a call to Locust and Linda. And Officer Barboza. I'm sitting on my porch. He's trying to arrest me now because I'm videotaping him over here. He's going to lock me up. Okay, so what is your question, sir? What's going on? I I'm doing something illegal sitting on my porch on my property? Yeah, if you're videotaping him without his knowledge, yes. Talk to the, you know, I, I, I've talked to everybody, people around here on what happened. And like, all they know, all people saw was, boom, all of a sudden this guy's got this crazy guy. has got this bad cop no donut sign hanging from his porch. What the fuck is he up to? Sitting on a porch, I come out here every day, you know, have a cup of coffee, feed the birds. You got a cop walking, walking back and forth. Back and forth, he's on his cell phone. Fuck this, fuck that. The old, old lady's walk, walking up the street there, and she doesn't even, doesn't even understand English, and she just kind of like... The cops got total disregard for, for, the, for, for the uniform, total disregard for elderly people. You, you're in full uniform. You're representing the city of Fall River. And I asked this guy, I said, I said dude, I said, why don't you chill out a little bit with the, with the language? He said, why don't you shut the fuck up? Mind your own fucking business. If when I said to him, tone it down, if he would have said, hey, sorry about that, that would have been the fucking end of it. Click the phone over to camcorder. I'm just scanning back and forth. I got him, de I got him dead center in the viewfinder. He asked me, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm videotaping you, dumbass. I said, I'm perfectly right at what I'm doing. Oh, I'm, calling, I'm arresting you. Oops, yeah, OK, I just got I'm still rolling. I got the camera pointing at him. Comes up the stairs, looks right, looks right at me. He says, you fucking welfare bum, you're under arrest. He walked me out of the gate, and all he kept saying from, from up there, the, the cruiser was parked over there, I'd love to punch you right in your fucking face. I can't, I, I want to punch you in your face. I just looked at him, like, go ahead, sweetheart. There was, no, there was no resisting arrest. The only thing that was illegal about the whole day is my getting arrested, him stepping foot in the yard, calling me an effing welfare bum, Product of the system brought up basically in foster care. It's not like you know, that's one thing that nobody's ever going to be able to say to me. You only got where you got because somebody handed it to you. Silver spoon. You fucking nuts. I'm lucky if I had a plastic spoon. George is friends with another victim of police brutality, a man named Dwayne Alves, better known as. Alves, 
P-I-M-P of the P-M. This is your man, Charlie Murphy, and I'm hanging out with the P-I-M-P of the P-M. Al Z on the Cape Cod's hottest music, 96.3. Yo, check this out. This is Flavor Flav, and you should be listening to Al Z, the P-I-M-P on the A-M. The P-M. <laughs> I just secured seven days a week at different clubs all over Cape Cod. But then I came upon the fateful day, May 25th, 2011. Dwayne was DJing at the Steakhouse Sports Bar in Hyannis. He says some non-uniformed law enforcement officers or agents were drunk and disrespecting a group of women. I heard that there are off-duty cops groping a lady or, you know, I don't know, putting their hands on her. That's accurate. And then you ask the cops, you know, just leave the girl alone. Why would you keep bothering her? No, never, I never spoke to the cops. No. That's the fun. You that's know they were cops? Yeah, oh yeah, I know they were cops. You know they were. Well, Wiz, that big conference that they do every year, they were doing it for 13 years and there was 800 undercover narcotics cops. This is what I know, that they had a, a, a conference a couple years ago and they went to the boathouse and they had a fight there. Yep. I mean, I remember at times over the past where the cops come down here or, or whomever they might be and uh, raise holy hell. I remember one time, didn't they trash the uh, one of the hotels down yeah. here, the oh, Cape Cod or something like that? Allegedly, yeah. Yeah, allegedly, right. That Wednesday before Memorial Day weekend, if there's a bunch of guys that look like golfers, they ain't golfers. A little shocked. Uh, Dwayne Alves tells us he was jumped by 8 to 12 guys, and he believes most or all are members of law enforcement. Dwayne says bouncers were trying to help, but the group was blocking them. I worked in over half a dozen restaurants and bars as a bartender and a cook, and I've never seen anything like this on Cape Cod in my life. I could see guys walking from across the street in every direction and all walking up to the steakhouse and they were all on their cell phones. And as I was getting ready to call the police, Alzi had passed out. Cause now you could just kind of feel the building, just the pressure of people outside, like wanting to come in. Alzi wound up filing charges against three of the law enforcement agents that beat him up. Christopher Borum, John Daly, and Ariel Colazzo. George and Alzi met through Alzi's uncle, Alan Alves a retired Freetown detective that won multiple discrimination lawsuits against the city. I wanted to be Superman, Batman, I grew up with all those, and I didn't like cops. So I figured that, you know, I could make a change. Pushed at the academy, I graduated at the top of my class, the highest in the history of the Massachusetts State Police Academy. Came back to go to work, and my job I was working the midnight to eight shift, washing and waxing the police cruisers. I could trust people that I arrested more than I could trust them brother officers I worked with. You know, it's the only job where the first day on the job, you're a boss. You're everybody's boss. There's no job like that in the world. Where you get out of the academy, here's a car, here's a license, you're everybody's boss out there. After Alan introduced the two, Alzi followed George to court for his big day. This is DJ Alzi reporting for whoever. All right, we're on our way to court. Hopefully, uh, charges get dismissed. If not, the battle's on. That's it. Now, they're accusing you of resetting your own telephone. That's correct, right? But, oh, yeah. You see, uh, it could have been done from the cloud. The only clouds hanging over the police station. <laughs> because there's no way possible of, uh, of me resetting the phone. Why would you even do that? <laughs> the video is going to do nothing but help you, I would assume, right? I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't waste my time deleting something that I wanted everybody to see. So this is actually a training bulletin that was issued by Sergeant Andrew Cook to the Fall River Police Department. And it's basically stating that citizens do have the right to record you. They had to review everything and then they turned around and they signed off on it. Where is he? There he is. Thomas Barboza is the arresting officer. Charges have been thrown out against a Fall River man who videotaped a police officer. And this case has led to significant policy changes at the police department. George had a renewed sense of invulnerability. And he took that invulnerability right to the mayor's office. On this end. But, and I don't, like I said, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm oh, just trying. And I love to make a statement. I see you got one, two, three, four cameras. I'm, try, I'm trying to ask. I'm, I'm asking you for your help. Yeah. The governor's office told me you need to speak with the mayor. Sure. And let me make a statement. No matter how small a dime is, uh, there's always two sides to it. So I'm sure there's two sides here, too. 
What about the uh, the resisting arrest uh, charges? Those were dropped as well. Everything was dropped. It was an illegal arrest. You can't arrest somebody if you don't have probable cause. With his phone mysteriously wiped while in police custody, George wanted the city council to ask for an independent investigation. He made a call ahead of time to city councilor Ray Mitchell. I'm, 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 out. I'm originally from this city. I I should have been I should have been. All set up for life when I got out of foster care. I was a paycheck. I was supposed to be a statistic. I'm going to be an example. Next, we have George Thompson, subject matter of police. <coughs> I did speak with Mr. Thompson today. If there's any proof that something, someone did something illegal, they will be held accountable. The phone is in their possession. And they've, got, he, they've got cameras all over the police station. Who had the phone in their hand that day? He's too right, busy Thompson, out for... Thank you very much, sir. We understand. We heard you loud and clear. As the council pointed out, there's an investigation going on. He's asking you to give him That's some time not what to I'm, I'm not asking the, the police department to investigate the we police. Understand. I'm we asking understand. for that outside investigation. Okay. I'm asking for the spineless upstairs okay. to order that investigation that he should have done, that the governor's office said he should have right. done. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Next, we have Dan Patello. Subject matter, I his support for River I was found Park. innocent. Police officer arrested me after knowingly, viola knowingly violating my rights. Yeah, I've never had so much attention come from the city council before till I stopped flipping them papers up. No, look, here, look, here's hard proof. And, and this is, this is pa paperwork that, that they've given me, you know? Now what are you going to say? My rights are violated. The chief said my rights were violated in this press release. George was a force to be reckoned with. Here's a man that knows he was wronged and will do everything in his power to right that wrong. Think of your life like you, you're sitting behind the wheel of a car. Rear mirror is this big. It's just to remind you what, what's behind you. Your windshield is five feet across, six feet across. It's a lot clearer. Looking out, looking out that front window and there's the back window. That's more important is what's ahead of you. Indianapolis, they call it nap town. Tiring, sleeping, boring. It's like a town more than a city. New York is a city. LA is a city. My mother, my auntie is the only reason why I'm in Indianapolis currently. Other than that, it's really, I don't really have no, really no reason to really be here. I don't have no, I never really, like fit in in Indianapolis is forever something happened to me when I'm in Indianapolis. And, uh, so I don't really like being in Indianapolis for that measure. And, uh, that's really it, really. really. Yeah. This is something I do. Indianapolis is Dario Lee. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dario Lee, not guilty of robbery. Your choice. And I did that right here. I made this beat right here. Basketball got into it. I kind of got serious about it once I started dunking and everybody was laughing at me about it. So kind of got serious about playing basketball then. I just got the phone with Clark State University. I was planning to go play ball and I got a call from my lawyer. Um, he said, yeah, do you know these two guys? And I, I was like, no, nah, I don't know who they are. Well, there's a warrant for your arrest saying that you had something to do with a robbery. We went to trial and Jack, uh, he, he came into trial, he, he spoke, which I was so grateful. This is my boss right here. Can you tell from, from these sheets how many hours uh, Mr. Lee worked that day? He was paid for eight hours that day. Okay. And it's something he keeps track of these time sheets, is that correct? That is correct. I was at work. There's not even no investigation. I don't care if you Matlock, you're not gonna crack a code of nothing. Everyone thought it was over. They were there and they was hugging me. My support system was there and everything. But they, none of them knew that the whole time something didn't seem correct to me. Dario may not have been killed by the police, but in a sense, his life was still taken away.
Although he was found not guilty, the state of Indiana refused to expunge the verdict from his record. The state's justification is that just because he was found not guilty doesn't mean that he didn't do it. I lost my scholarships for me to go to school. I've called downtown so many times, talked to so many folks, like, oh, you're screwed, you're this, you're that. And that's the first thing they'll say is you're screwed. Here we go. Almost one year after Bobby Henning's death, Liz and Everett filed their lawsuit. We just wanted answers. You gotta understand, when, when we finally did get a lawyer, we were just hoping to know what happened. I mean, to see an autopsy report. When there's a child involved, the only way a parent can sue is for civil right violations, which obviously when you end up dead in the middle of a the street, there's some civil right violations, whether they want to say there are or not. Trial was scheduled for September 2014, and depositions began. A deposition is oral testimony that is written down and usually used against you in court. Liz submitted to hers on June 13th. July 17th, 2014. A man named Eric Garner had just broken up a fight. Officer Daniel Pantaleo placed Garner in a 15-second chokehold from behind, a move which is prohibited by NYPD policy, and took Garner to the ground. Garner would utter his final words, I can't breathe. Eleven times before losing consciousness. August 5th, 2014. A man named John Crawford picked up an unpackaged BB gun inside a Walmart in Ohio, casually walking around while talking to his girlfriend on the phone. A customer, Ronald Ritchie, called 911. Beaver Creek 911, where's your emergency? I'm at the uh, Beaver Creek Walmart. There's a uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. What does he look like? He's a black male, probably about six foot tall. Ronald Ritchie caused two deaths with his phone call. John Crawford, a man who is committing no crime and minding his own business, and a woman who died of a heart attack while fleeing the scene. And then, on August 9th, 2014, 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot and killed by Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. Killed him for no reason. They said he had his hands up and everything, man. Like, trying to get at him? I don't know. I went out. I just heard the gunshot. I heard the gunshot. There's several more units over here. There's going to be a problem. Dario wound up leaving Indianapolis on a road trip. I don't know. I left Indianapolis and I went to uh, Chicago. So I left Chicago and got to St. Louis. From St. Louis, went to Ferguson. Ferguson and St. Louis, really the same. So I just went up to where Mike Brown uh, was murdered. All right, rest in peace. You know what kills me the most? Man, how beautiful this neighborhood is, man. And to think that this was a bomb with, like, tear gas. You know what? Uh, 33 inches for my basketball number I got in LA. So. Tell them what happened to the store. You got ride. You got, you got, when that ride hit, they hit us up. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, but we took all the burning furniture out of here. Uh huh. Yeah, they tried to burn us down. They tried to burn us down. Okay, so me and Reginald is about to wash, I'm about to wash dishes. Left Ferguson and uh, made my way to Portland, passed through Sacramento. Came down to Los Angeles. I plan to live the West Coast life. Um, but uh, yeah. The family of Michael Nida was in touch with another family that lost a loved one to the police. His name was Ignacio Nacho Ochoa. Lo, él iba rumbo a la tienda en su bicicleta. Cuando lo, los sheriffs lo pararon, lo esposaron. A lo que dicen que él preguntaba por qué lo habían esposado si no había hecho nada malo y simplemente le dieron, lo esposaron, le dieron un balazo aquí en la cintura y lo dejaron desangrar, más bien morir ahí en el piso. Shortly after Nacho was killed, an ex-cop 
turned private investigator named Alex Salazar started interviewing eyewitnesses. Now 8.37 p.m. My name is Alex Salazar. There was an incident that occurred here on the streets. Uh, do you remember that? Yes, I do. And uh, did something attract your attention? One or two gunshots. And, and at no time did you hear any commands or, or any directions by the officers, is that correct? That's correct. I didn't hear any sirens. I didn't hear anything. All I heard was a gunshot. Hi, everyone. I just want to say thank you for all the support, all your love. They kill him. They don't know. They kill us, too. Just when I had thought that no one was going to show up, you guys did show up. And I'm grateful for that because I thought I had lost all my support. I just miss my dad, and I wish I can, he can hug me like he usually does when he sees me. La única que enfrenta la impotencia y el dolor. Alex ayudó con las investigaciones. Ellos se miran otro año uniforme. Uh, yo tengo el poder del condado. Yo tengo la placa. Yo tengo la pistola. My name is Alex Salazar. I live in Los Angeles, California. My mom came here and from Mexico, Sonora, Mexico, and, and met my dad. Three years later, uh, I came along. Got out of the Air Force on December 1st, 1989, which was a Friday. Had that weekend off, Saturday and Sunday, and then on Monday, December 4th, 1989, I started the LAPD Academy. It was uh, quite a transition from, you know, going straight from the military uh, into the police department, but some strings were pulled uh, by my then father-in-law. At that time, when I came on in 1990, uh, it was still the era uh, prior to Rodney King. You could still get away with things. It is very dangerous. You don't know if you can get killed. Uh, you don't know if you go to work that night if you're going to come back. You know, when I signed up, I, I signed up knowing that fully well. Uh, what I didn't understand was how it would change me. I had essentially seen a uh, robbery, street robbery, while off duty. Uh, we got into a big old fight. I wound up in the middle of the street where I pull out my gun and I tell them, you know, I'm going to shoot you, I'm going to kill you. And they're telling me, Matame, kill me. At that point, a car came out of nowhere and ran me over. And when I began going to see the shrink, I wasn't able to tell him exactly how I felt inside, that I had this deep-seated rage now. Of course, after that incident, my, my viewpoint became very skewed. And then after that, we had Rodney King. Rodney King was a 26-year-old taxi driver who was pulled over after a high-speed chase with the LAPD. Four police officers beat him, while several others looked on. You know, we were, we were rooting for the cops. You know, we were like, oh gosh, you know, what's going to happen here? You know, there's this age of the video cameras now where, where everything can be seen. The jury acquitted all four of the officers, and Los Angeles was on fire. You know, can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? The police officers were happy, of course. Okay, they had gotten off, they weren't going into prison, not at that time anyhow. It got so bad, so far out of control that they had to call in the National Guard. 30 years prior, in 1965, a section of South LA known as Watts became enraged over the beating of a black motorist. On Wednesday night, August the 11th, a crowd attracted by the arrest of a traffic violator, unruly and difficult. Rocks, bottles, and other objects thrown at law enforcement officers, and civil disobedience erupted. That was during the civil rights movement. You know, a period, the Watts riots, a time when there was a lot of segregation. And, and of course, the blacks were, were very angry, okay, because the whites would straight out call them niggers. All right, let's have to receive the two male niggers on motorbikes were walking talking in the vicinity of 5900 Block South Avenue. Here we are, the year 2014, okay? Talking about you know, Michael Brown here a couple days ago. I mean, has anything really changed? Hey, cut block. Cut block here on scene, man. Tell me about it. What do you think about what's going on here? It's fucked up, man. It's a peaceful protest. Right. I see them firing. They ain't giving us justice, man. They ain't giving us justice. We need justice. Can we get justice? Please, can we get justice? Can we one time have our justice?
I find myself here in the middle of this because I wanted to see what, what these people were feeling. What's, what's going on here? They wanted to be, you know, submissive in the sense that, you know, we don't want to fight. We just want to protest. You know, this family here that I had a, a great time being with for about five days, typical American family. And on one occasion, he was playing the piano. He was just kind of away from the flashbangs, the tear gas, the yelling, the screaming. We're no longer afraid. It was, it was beautiful. David is uh, the leader in, in Ferguson, the one at Ground Zero. What's going on, Alex? Hey, David. How you doing, brother? We're doing okay. We're doing okay. Well, we're doing better. Somebody lit the memorial on fire, the one that's on the sidewalk, that's, uh, that's uh, all the stuff that was around the lamppost. Right. That stuff was burned to the ground. It was a blaze. It was clearly an arson. I would, I would hope that things could end on a high, peaceful note. But at the looks of things, it seems that war is what they want. On August 20th, 2014, a grand jury started hearing evidence in the case of Missouri versus Darren Wilson, the officer who shot Michael Brown. Not too long before the Kelly Thomas verdict, there was another incident with law enforcement that made national headlines. This is brand new video tonight showing accused triple murderer Christopher Dorner shooting guns during his extensive training at the Los Angeles Police Academy. In his manifesto, Dorner declared unconventional and asymmetric warfare against his former employers at the LAPD. And warfare he waged. 1199, run at Arlington. Officer shot multiple times. Copy 1199, Lincoln 31. You know, nobody was surprised by Christopher Dorner. People were just saying, we're surprised it didn't happen sooner. I had my own situation with Los Angeles Police Department in 1997. I met 17, coming up on 18 years on the job. And I was a sergeant at the time, and there was domestic violence in the home. And I never wanted LAPD to know about this situation because, after all, I'm still married to this man. He's the father of my kids. And they decided I should be able to command my police officer husband um, to act in a way that um, you know, was more pleasing to me because I'm a sergeant and so I should just be able to give him a direct order to knock it off. And they didn't believe that I could be the victim of domestic violence and I was told that you probably give as good as you get. And I was told that there's not a mother in the cosmos that would put up with that kind of a situation that you've just described to us. So sergeant, we don't believe you. You've given false and misleading statements to an internal affairs investigator. The same thing that they charged Christopher Dorner with. So I'm facing termination now and all the money that I've paid into this retirement system I lose and I started this job with a high school education and I've got four kids and what kind of job would I find as a fired LAPD sergeant and so I thought about jumping off the third level of the Bradbury building because in my mind I thought if I jump at least my kids will get the life insurance that I've been paying on for the last 17 years, and they'll at least have money because I'm not gonna have any. And so I understand how LAPD will grind you down and wear you down and make you wanna do something that is not in your character. Christopher Dorner got everyone's attention. Not only had this guy declared war on the LAPD, he appeared to be winning at least for a while. On the scanner, they were talking about right before they torched him. I, I remember hearing it and just being like, "What? what is this? We don't see that over someone who murders their neighbor and goes on the run or anything like that. The militarization that we saw with that is what's happening everywhere. It's just so excessive, and everything that they're doing is so excessive, especially with all the fun toys that they're getting from the Department of Justice that they have to use or they have to return them. After that, the next thing was Kelly Thomas, and then going to Ferguson. I was out there for Mike Brown's funeral. There's a lot of energy, a lot of protesting. People were out late 
like you have a protest and eventually it ends. Theirs just seemed to be perpetual. The only reason that this has become such a national, like international discussion is because people did something stupid. This beauty supply store is on fire and there's a huge fire down there. Things can be replaced and human lives can't. And so if this is gonna start a discussion that could lead to change that's gonna save lives, how bad is it what they did? As we all waited on the edge of our seats, the police in Cleveland, Ohio, shot a 12-year-old boy named Tamir Rice. And there was a guy in there with a pistol. You know, I saw his face, but he's like pointing at everybody. Although the 911 caller said that the gun that Tamir was playing with was probably fake and that he was a kid, that information was not passed on to the cops. Is he black or white? He's black. Officer Daniel Pantaleo began testifying before a grand jury for the murder of Eric Garner. If the direction of Ferguson's grand jury was any indication, things were about to get ugly. So, you know, the whole Michael Brown thing is troubling to me because obviously I don't know. You know, I'm in another state. And whatever it was that happened led us to this deadly force situation. And I think truthfully that it was something that probably could have been avoided. I think had Darren Wilson and I got personally involved in that traffic stop, because that's all it was. It was an infraction. It wasn't even a misdemeanor. It was an infraction. And then at some point it became physical. And then when that happened, Darren Wilson got scared. And so I think people may be on some level in Ferguson understand that, that we're not gonna get what we want out of this. We're not gonna get that indictment. But even if they were to get an indictment, it changes nothing. Because the problems in Ferguson is the Ferguson Police Department. And the problems on the Ferguson Police Department are cultural and they're systemic. I think there may be a chilling effect and I think that every police officer through this failure to indict will understand that all I've got to ever say when I do something that I shouldn't do is that I was afraid. I couldn't see his hands. He was going for his waistband. I got scared. And so, you know, that's why I say, officer, if you're scared, call the police then maybe you should go back to the station and turn in your gun and your badge and maybe go work in a pizzeria. I don't know. About to leave for my third trip. <laughs> I'm a little worried about the police. I packed a bulletproof vest. <laughs> it's right here. But it's only a class two. I should really have a class three because cops are crazy. I just have to figure out how to explain this to the airport security. I have goggles and <laughs> bulletproof vest. I think that when your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. They just brought in a lot of really big hammers. Wouldn't miss it for the world though. <laughs> They're making history. But first and, and foremost, I'd like to again extend my deepest sympathies to the family of Michael Brown. The duty of the grand jury is to separate fact from fiction. They determined that no probable cause exists to file any charge against Officer Wilson and returned a no true bill on each of the five indictments. The citizens of this community should be, and I know are very mindful of the fact that, that the whole world is watching and watching how we respond and how we react. Express those feelings, express them in a constructive way, and try to make some changes so that nothing like this ever happens again. Protests were being held in 170 cities across America. When the system fails to give us justice, we have to create our own justice. We want justice for the little baby boy, Tamir right. Rice, who was murdered at 12 years old, standing in a park. Hey, get out the way. Rodney King said, can we all get returned to Ferguson. on the front porch, smoking a cigarette. Uh-huh. And I heard gunshots. I heard like three or four. Then it paused for like two or three seconds, and it was followed by like three or more four gunshots. And I ran, I heard, and I seen Michael Brown just laying in the street. Mm -hmm. Killed him for no reason. Do you see a knife? Do you see anything that would have caused a threat to uh, these motherfucking police officers? They shot that boy because they wanted to shoot that boy. Wait, hold on, what? Wait a minute, they just killed dude. In the middle of the motherfucking street. Said he had his hands up and everything, they still shot him. He fell on the ground, they stood over him, shot him some more. I knew that everybody was on edge. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't name no motherfucker who wasn't sitting on the edge of their seat 
like when the verdict, what they gonna say? What they gonna say? Cause they don't do nothing about this. We gonna turn this motherfucker, we fed up. All I war, like fuck it. Whatever you gonna do to me, dude, cause I'm tired. Whatever you gonna do, you done did everything. You done did everything except kill me. Bobby. That's the uncle of Oscar Grant. Oscar's death in 2009 was the first high-profile officer-involved shooting of the 21st century, captured on cell phones and shared around the world. The officer was found guilty, and at the time, you might have thought it was the end of police brutality. Bobby, how you doing? That's Oscar's aunt. Hey man, I'm a, I don't have a chance to talk right now, but I got a lot to talk to you about. And that is... We'll come back to him. They want war. They want war, man. Come when they on, when man. they call for the National Guard for us just protesting, that means they declare war against the black people, against the protest. I got kids, they ride past that. What should I do if the police pull me up? Shit, son, don't stop for them. I got three kids and a wife. And when all this madness kicked off, you know, after that Sunday, I was trying to get my family out of here because I seen what they did. We got no help. My whole family was in here choking. We on the third floor, you know, all the way in the back of Canfield. You know, if, if I, my kids can't have no future, then there is no future to be had, you know? So to the end of time, we have to continue to fight. We have to teach our kids what the things of the past were so they don't make the same mistakes and move forward. Keep their forward progress going in the old system will not have no grounds or no base to even establish yourself again because generations is constantly evolving and constantly going past. All right, brother, thank you very much. To surround these news tents, say we will interview Captain Ray so white America sees that he supports us. Well, Captain Lewis, Alex Salazar, how are you, sir? Alex! They will not put my face out there because they know white America respects more than anything else either a white commanding officer of a police department or a white commander of the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. They are the type of people white America respects. They are not going to get me out there to say mm -hmm. Darren Wilson murdered Michael Brown Jr. And they will not get me out there to say that this Bob McCulloch and the grand jury was a, a total disgrace and that was a cover up and McCulloch should go to jail. He should have recused himself in the beginning yes. solely for the fact that he stated he always wanted to be a cop. And now his uncle, his brother, his cousin are mm -hmm. all on the St. Louis uh, Police Department. McCulloch's mother worked for the St. Louis Police Department. Okay. You telling me this guy's going to be fair? It was an insult to the black community. His father, in fact, was killed. Oh, you! I, I forgot to make the biggest thing. Right. The biggest thing is his father was a policeman who was killed by a black man. Right. Thank you. We're going to have all I say burn all this shit down. No. National Guard, sir, for what? They ain't here to serve and protect our lads. They here to serve and protect the white motherfuckers across the street. And if we don't get this motherfucker, they in this shit. They in they need to burn down all this motherfucking That's a shit. That's hole right there. Been a year that I will never, ever forget. There's always been shootings that have occurred, uh, police officer involved shootings, but you know, something about Ferguson that, that caught my eye when I went back there in, in August, the people there just seemed like they were tired of it. I mean, I'm not one for, for being violent, but I am one for a revolution that requires change. Alex went from Ferguson to Cleveland for the funeral of Tamir Rice. Why does every situation have to be deadly for shoes when it's our kids or it, not just black kids, I'm not just saying it, anybody. In any situation, I think there's something else that could have been done. He was a typical 12 year old kid. He was always laughing, joking, playing. He was always busy and moving. He was a joy to be around. And so there I was in Cleveland, Eric Garner decision came out. It was at that time that all the marches all over the country began taking off. Attended several meetings. I, I spoke at one. Okay, right here in Brooklyn for the latest uh, police shooting. A young man was coming from his girlfriend's house, and as the police was going up the stairs, he shot him. Ferguson has been doing this thing since August, and they're looking to us to ignite and 
in New York City. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Salazar. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm a private investigator, and I'm also an ex-fucking pig. I think it was called a pig during protest, during Rodney King, during the whole riot situation. We would be met by people, and, and they'd be spitting at us. They'd be throwing rocks. Fuck the pigs. I would just kind of, you know, keep it to myself. I wouldn't really say anything. And then one day I, I had a partner, white guy, who he was like, let's go get these wetbacks. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I, I mean, I look at my skin, but I was thinking, I'm Latino, I'm, I'm a brownie. He stops these undocumented immigrants. It's a family, it's a father with his wife and I think three or four kids. He took away his car because he said, you know, I know that wetback doesn't have a driver's license. The tow truck's showing up and, and they're taking away the car and the kids are crying and the wife is looking at me with a pissed off look because they're Latinos. I'm Latino and, and you know, you could tell that the man, he just had his head down ashamed and the kids were starting to cry. And it was at that moment that I came to the realization of that's why they call us pigs. The end of 2014 was non-stop. It seemed like every day there was another march, another shooting. The entire world was paying attention. People everywhere were talking about police brutality. I wanted to know after I left law enforcement, what the heck happened to me? And that's where I began to ask these questions. And I came from a good family. I had some very responsible positions. And all of a sudden, I become a police officer. Within two years, I'm all screwed up. I'm no longer the same. All right, let's see it. Get up now. Well, don't mess it up. My neighbor's houses. It is coming down. Come over here and say hi to your grandma. Hi, Grandma! Hi, Jean. Hi. How was 2014 for you? It was um, kind of like 2013, kind of like uh, 2012. The agony and the emptiness in your heart never goes away. I mean, you, you go on with daily life. Michael loved the holidays. He loved July 4th, Halloween, Christmas. So we tried it, you know, just to continue on. Yes, we have a lot of anger, us families who have lost a loved one to police. Yes, we have anger, and yes, when we get out there and protest, that anger comes out. But if that's all we do, I don't think that's gonna get us anywhere. Someone needs to talk to the police because for Pete's sake, we're paying their salaries. I mean, they think that we work for them, which is the other way around. 38, I got one running from me towards the Walgreens. The cop gets on the airwave and says, I have a suspect running because he was, he was looking around, she said, suspiciously. He was looking around suspiciously. He was looking around to make sure he didn't get hit by a car, but instead he got hit. I wish he got hit by a car, maybe he had lived. Are there any? Four, two, four, one. We got again. <laughs> fired. Units are covering 38 shots fired, 10 4. The killer of Michael is free, walking around free. The reason our case was settled was. Their attorneys wanted to put my grandchildren on the stand. Well, how did you feel about your daddy being shot? Do you know who shot your daddy? Why in God's name would anybody do that to a child? Yay! 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 Liz and Everett, my heart just goes out to them because their son was killed so far away. I bet they were just like me. They didn't believe that this was happening out there until their son was killed. I was one of those people that would drive down the road and see people protesting, and I'd be the person looking forward straight ahead, not looking at them, don't want them to see me. Not that I didn't believe what they were doing, but I just, tunnel vision, what I was taught to do.
he always had a girlfriend. <laughs> Bobby was, you know, beautiful smile, beautiful eyes. So he had no problems, always having a girlfriend. So he, and when he met Brandy, I must have been around, I'm thinking 2010, about five or six months maybe, pretty quick into the relationship. I, I get home from work and Everett says, you better sit down. And I'm like, sit down? What do I need to sit down for? <laughs> He said, oh, by the way, Brandy's pregnant. They decided they were gonna go back to Oklahoma so she could have the baby there with her mom, and I thought that was a good idea. They were on that journey of going from where mom lives to where mom lives to where mom lives to where mom lives, you know, as kids do. You know, the same cycle starts all over again. Next thing I know, Bobby's heading out towards California. They had broke up. He bought this new little used Mercedes. It was a nice car. So he was cleaning up, going back with his little shiny Mercedes for his daughter's birthday. And um, then this. I had talked to Bobby that day. I believe I might possibly have been the last one to talk to Bobby. Talked to him because I had set up for him to talk to someone while he was here. And he says, well, I'll talk to that person when I get back. Right now, I want to go see my baby for her birthday. So he had made later that evening a call to his older brother, Tony. And Tony wasn't able to take the call. That I do know. Hey, what's up? Uh, I'm down here in LA, just chilling. I'm not dead. And they wrote a police report that I am dead. So I'm, I guess I'm no longer myself. Time is unknown. Um, I don't think they really the fucking police report, though. I never died here, so yeah. All right. The day of the 21st, I went to work, and I remember going out on break. I called Bobby, and I said, Bobby, it's mom. I'm worried about you. What's going on? And later, I realized he was already dead. And where was his cell phone? It's a fucking box at the sheriff's department or at the coroner's office with the phone going off. So I was pulling up here in the little drive. There was a sheriff's car sitting out there. And I can't tell you how I knew, but I knew that something was up with Bobby. So I was hoping that he was going to tell me that Bobby had done something, got arrested. You know, he asked, are, are you Robert Henning's mother? I said, I am. And he goes, can I come in? He said, I, I think you should sit down. Alex was flying to Washington, D.C. for the first time in his life. a young guy I interviewed uh, two days ago and uh, he is working working in the LAPD and I wanted to get understanding of his experience working the street you know what it's like what is he up against how old is he 27 27 okay and he's thinking about becoming a firefighter oh wow <laughs> he was in, in the last shootout he was in Automatic rifles, uh, and one bullet grazed his head. Oh my gosh. So they were shooting at him with yeah, an automatic. Yeah, gun battle. Oh wow. Um, so you know. He's having know. second thoughts here. Having second thoughts. Right.
Good morning, everyone. My name is John Mutz, and we're here in Washington, D.C., and we're about to meet a group of officers who have uh, taken a stand. I think it's a really uh, momentous occasion. I was on the Los Angeles Police Department for 25 years. I retired as a captain, served about 10 years as a commanding officer. So I read Cheryl's book. Cheryl actually worked in the same area where I worked, but I, I never, never met her. At least I don't think I met her. We'll see. She's, a, she's an extraordinary leader. Hello. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, Dylan. How are you? In person. Good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> My goodness. First on the itinerary was a town hall meeting. When I was a young kid, I got locked up. I got arrested. I'm in the corner. I didn't want to be fingerprinted. I had been up crying. And it, this, I never get this big, big white officer. He walked over to me. He says, listen, we're going to fingerprint you. He said, down here, we do it two ways. He said, conscious or unconscious. You decide which way you want to go. But I never get this black officer. He walks over. He comes. He says, let me talk to you. He said, son, he said, look, man, he said, you and people don't fight this part of the process. They go through it. He said, I believe you didn't do it. I believe you. He said, but you got to go through this now. So we've gathered here as law enforcement officers. We know there are two forms of policing in America, one for black and brown and one for white. We know that's a fact. What do you do, though, when you realize that you're in uh, a system that has institutional racism and sexism, and then what do you do when you're leading it? Mm -hmm. We got a really big break when Rodney King happened. But then all of a sudden, it stopped. We got a new regime, and they said, how many arrests have you made? How many tickets did you write? All those kinds of things. And I began to get punished and hazed and all kinds of stuff. John, whatever happened to you? You know, you were like the poster boy for, for the LAPD. What happened to you? And I go, you know, Chief, uh, Nothing really happened to me except that I, I woke up and I started listening more to people in the community than I did our, our staff. The genesis of this work for me was conversations that I was having in St. Louis. As you all know, uh, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. Ready? 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 R-E-D-D-I-T-T. And launched a movement that caught fire across this country. Having said that, you know, that's what brings us here today. And I'm telling you, this is only the beginning. The group had two meetings scheduled. One with John Lewis, and another with Sheila Jackson Lee. Although they had an appointment, John Lewis was not there. The series, just one after the other, the activism, the protests, has really made an impact on the Democrats on the House and the Senate. The bad news is we are in the minority. One thing about Washington, D.C., it's a whole bunch of political BS. You can't never get that twisted. What we put together is fairly unprecedented. Of law enforcement officers from around the country, Los Angeles, New York City, uh, D.C. And a lot of it is by, you know, the way they, you know, the way they engage someone. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this, how police officers are trained to engage someone is to get control, to dominate, to have people do what they say, and if right. they don't, get louder. So the first part of legal authority to do stuff is you tell them, and if they don't do it, you tell them what's going to happen. If they don't do that, then you do handcuff them or have them, you know, lie down on the ground or whatever. But it's all about your demonstrating your legal authority to do it. You know, we don't know, but I believe that that kind of context can lead to uh, what we saw in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. In five days, and we'll include that as part of the record as well. Chairman, Here, yes, I just want to acknowledge that I have a group, uh, retired law enforcement, the National Coalition of Law Enforcement Officers, who are in the audience. I just want to acknowledge them, the Cleo, and uh, thank them for their presence here today. So, thank you. How long are you going to be in uh, Washington? Uh, just these couple of days. Here. Okay, great. We're trying to get in with uh, your other uh, manager, Mr. Lewis, uh, to see him. Okay. Uh, I wasn't allowed to film the meeting, but I was allowed to take pictures. She said she would organize a hearing in the future and invite the group back to speak. 
When a person has had contact with the police, can they say they were treated with dignity and respect? One of the elements of serving the community is the, the concept of customer service. And how do you decide whether you've achieved it? You ask the customers, you ask the people you're serving in the community, you know, how are we doing? People who are not tuned in to providing that kind of service, uh, you're never gonna get there. Alex was being quiet. Hey. Alex, final thoughts before we get in the car? Just, you know, you only live once, and I gotta say that I've lived a very beautiful life, a very charmed life, a sad life. Um, I've experienced all human emotions. You know, there's been times where You know, I didn't want to live. But I'm just happy. I'm just happy that I got to do something important. I got to talk about these problems. These problems that have destroyed so many lives, that have taken away loved ones, family members, fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, best friends. It's given me hope. You know, it's given me hope. My porch and my property. Yep, if you're videotaping him without his knowledge, yes. Become charging into my into my yard. That's okay. That's okay. You know something? A federal offense. Yeah. Okay. Well. So. Yeah. With what they with what they did to me, it may not be that uh seem that that big. They're trying to throw me in jail for a felony. You know, didn't do didn't do anything wrong. And how many people got involved in trying to prosecute me? This street never used to exist. This house was actually picked up and turned around and the front door was brought over to here when they made this street. Fall River police officer lives over here. It's kind of ironic, but, and we get along great. You know, not, not if it came to something with the police, you still have that. It's like, even if they're your friends, they're not when it comes to backing up one of their buddies. Car sounds like it's falling apart. Filed uh, in federal court December 8th. You know, I'm fighting them not just for me, but I'm fighting them for a lot of people now. Welcome to the East Coast. <laughs> There he is. What's going on? Which truck? That Spectre. Oh, that's what you're driving now? Yeah. How much are we supposed to get? How much more shit are we supposed oh, to get? We are light time. Is that Nature North Street? Yeah. What's going on there? Someone got in a fight and they're passed out upstairs and I don't, I just want someone here. He's unconscious. Okay. Ah! <laughs> Lived Cape Cod all my life and I don't think I've ever seen that thing down or seen a train go over it. That's crazy. Back on Cape Cod on the Mid-Cape Highway, the highway that stretches the length of the Cape and we're headed to the spot where it all happened. I made a run for it out this door and I was stopped right there. I didn't even, my car was right here. I was just trying to figure I could make it to my car before they even noticed it was me, but they were looking for me, so that didn't happen. It, yeah, it makes me leery to come to Hyannis. I don't come to Hyannis. I used to work in Hyannis probably five nights a week. I lived in Hyannis. Now I don't even come to Hyannis. Christmas shopping, off Cape. For 13 years prior to 2011, 
the New England Narcotics Officers Association um, conference was. It's a three-day conference, which starts on Wednesday and goes till Friday. The inc my incident happened Wednesday night, and I spent the night in the hospital till Thursday afternoon, and Friday morning I met with Barnstable PD. And we came here in an undercover car, and we parked right over here at the edge of the parking lot because this is the main exit where all the officers were um, leaving the conference. So we were, they were trying to see if I could identify anybody else that was involved with the incident. Think about that. I'm getting jumped by nine people, and they expect me to identify all of them. And that, that was the only one who was showing a photo lineup was me. Kind of hard to identify people. I mean, the best photo lineup they could have showed me was their feet and their fists, because that's the most I saw of all. <laughs> most of them you know what I mean if they showed me John Daly's sneakers I would have identified him by his sneakers for sure because they probably kicked me at least two or three times all right I'm cold <laughs> Alzi's trial was originally scheduled for April 1st but wound up being delayed to the beginning of May April 12th 2015 25 year old Freddie Gray was arrested by Baltimore police after being placed in a transport van, Freddie fell into a coma due to mysterious spinal injuries. After his death, a week later, the medical examiner ruled it a homicide. Freddie's funeral on April 27th brought out Baltimore's rage. Alex found himself on the streets of Baltimore. It seemed like Ferguson all over again. Alex Salazar, are we falling? How are you doing there, sir? You cannot, you cannot make peace with an oppressor. Anybody who puts you in chains, if they are that sick to put you in chains, they're not going to take you out of chains because you ask, please. They're sociopaths. these people bro put that away you're antagonizing those people put it away hey that's crazy man ma'am get this guy out of here that's not how you get people that's not how you get people that's not how you get people i just want to stop for a second this is detective daniel hersel Purcell has been the subject of multiple brutality lawsuits, including one where he broke a man's jaw with a police radio. Why was a police officer with a history of violence that has cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars placed on the front line of protests in Baltimore? Get him! Move him out of there! Hold him back up, back up. Oh shit. The six officers involved in Freddie Gray's death were charged. The National Guard withdrew from Baltimore two days later, and the curfew was lifted. I don't know, hopefully you can see me. It's the evening before my case starts. Tomorrow's jury selection. This is it. The big day's finally here, and I'm ready. Good night. Alzi's trial wound up being at the same time and the same courthouse as the Boston Marathon bomber. 
This is the scene outside the courthouse. The Boston bombing suspect is in the sentencing phase, so it's somewhat of a zoo if you can see way down there. Lenny Keston, the most aggressive of all the lawyers and the most arrogant of all lawyers, if you will. All of his arguments are covered in lies and he tries to get the judge to believe that he's telling the truth and he's not. That's about it for now. I think it'll lie, I'm tired. I'm gonna get to try and get some good rest this weekend because I think the longest day was jury selection. Nobody wants to be on jury duty. Everybody, even if they're a bigot, they should be on there, like the guy that said he was a bigot, which would have sucked for me, but I could have veto vetoed him off. When you're fighting for something that you think's right, there's, there is no back down. And there hasn't been any back down for four years. I'm not gonna start now. I love nature. Uh, I love animals. I love the tranquility, the serenity, the, the lack of hustle and bustle. People were problems oftentimes in the uh, city. Not only with my job, but also in the neighborhood. Nobody bothers me out here. I have saved an area where I have not walked, I have not explored. I always want there to be that little mystery about the land. and. Uh, so I will die never having explored that little parcel. When I put on this suit, I still feel proud. And I know that is going to rub some people the wrong way because they think I should be ashamed of the uniform because of what it represents. I'm proud of it because it represents to me that I serve the public the way they should be served. The, the lowest form of police brutality, of police abuse, rather, is lip service. That's abuse. And I prided myself on not only not giving anyone lip service, but once I became a supervisor, I made sure that my subordinates were not giving people lip service. Captain Ray Lewis became known around the world after getting arrested at Occupy Wall Street in his old uniform. I cannot tell you how many people came up to me and said, thank you, Captain, you give us credibility and legitimacy. And everywhere I go, even today in Baltimore, Ferguson, I don't give you credibility. I'm here because you have credibility. Coincidentally, I was coming home that weekend to take care of some other business. I got home and I saw the letter from the Fraternal Order of Police. That's my union. The other letter was from the police commissioner. He went on, do you want me to read some of that? You or any other retiree have no authority or license expressed or implied to wear the official uniform in the Philadelphia Police Department. Be advised that I am prepared to take any and all necessary action, any and all. What am I going to do, find a, a horse's head in my bed? Please, I'll stop. I'll never go down there again. I'll never wear the uniform again. He didn't know that Captain Lewis could not be intimidated. You have to understand, in law enforcement, egos drive a lot. And you think cops have big egos. Try these alphabet cops. And also what you have here, which affects the population at large, it's called diffusion of responsibility. If you just had one cop fight this individual, then he knows, hey, I'm responsible. But when you have 30, each one of their sense of responsibility drops precipitously. To now they hardly feel responsible at all because they just blend in with this crowd. When my lawyer asked me on the stand yesterday, what proof do you have that Christopher Borum was even in the building or involved in the fight? And my answer was, I thank God for the discovery process of this case because Mr. Borum identified himself. They were assuming that I was reading and memorizing his deposition 
and they objected on the grounds of hearsay. I've sat through every deposition at this trial, which is probably pretty rare. I mean, there isn't a lawyer in that room, including my own, that was present for every single deposition. I, on the other hand, didn't miss one. So by being there at the deposition and witnessing Christopher Borum tell his story, it's no longer hearsay. With the Boston bomber trial going on, there was always a press pen outside. Hiding amongst the media offered me some camouflage I wouldn't have had otherwise. The cops that beat up Alzi had reached an almost mythical status, so it was weird to finally see their faces. As much as I wanted to ask for an interview, there's no point asking a question when you already know the answer. About to go back on the stand in about less than 45 minutes for the fifth day? Fifth day on the stand? And they, they're the ones that kept me. You know, out of those 14 hours, whatever it was, an hour and a half total with questions from my lawyer. Lenny Keston had me on the stand for two days, asking me the same question over and over again, and then trying to trick me to answer it differently. Oh. We're at Wayland at my brother's house right now. We had a rough day, a real rough day. The conspiracy charge we lost, so we're stripped down. I mean, we lost a lot to the cops. My lawyer wants me to make a settlement demand. Like I said, if you've heard people say, don't go against the cops, don't go after the cops, it's not worth it. They're right. Settlement correspondence, Alves versus Daly. I just don't like the way they're like, you know, go push it. No, I, I hate that part of it. I hate that part of it. I hate well, being enemies with my own lawyer. They're business men, right? They try, they're looking at their own neck and whether they're coming out of this with money or not. Right, and f that sucks. That's why it so goes to show the system's fucked up. Oh, yeah, that's why it, it, it favors people who have money. <laughs> Tomorrow's the big day. Everything I've ever worked for and I'm not sure if I'm gonna get screwed. So, my trial was supposed to end yesterday. Out of the blue, a blind side, it got carried over to Tuesday, and Tuesday is the four year anniversary of the beating. Back in my day, <laughs> you had to fix it yourself, because there wasn't that much money around. Still is it, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, it's been tough. I know he's he's struggled with it. Hopefully it'll turn out good for my son. If not, well, we just go on with life. That's all you can do. Oh, I wish I came home with a verdict, Gator. I'm glad you were at least able to come home. Just the fact that he's throwing these things out, he's like, okay, well, you weren't able to prove this, you weren't able to prove that. That means that the stuff that he's putting forward, you were able to prove. Yeah. Best DJ on Cape Cod, DJ Alvesy, hands down. Guy's been doing it for longer than most people have been drinking on this island, you know what I mean? For a small business owner like myself on Cape Cod, it's time to pay some bills from January. <laughs> Alvesy's performance at the Beach House was supposed to be a victory lap. He used to dance in the crowd and smile, but now all he wanted to do is hide on stage and avoid people. The cops that beat him up may not have killed Dwayne Alves, but DJ Alzi is another story. I'm pretty sure this is it. I mean, I might come back and play a one-off night somewhere in the summer with somebody, beach house or something. I got two more days of the rest of this life. Then after that, one way or another, it's a whole different me. Just left the federal court building. None of these cops were guilty of battery. None of them. None of them were guilty of assault. None of them. None of them were guilty of false imprisonment. None of them. 
the steakhouse was 40% liable and I was 60% liable of my own injuries. <laughs> Everett was visiting some friends on a nearby ranch in Northern California. He and Liz had finally settled with Los Angeles County. I'd say me and my wife probably spend, come here 90% of the time when we leave our house, we're headed this way. It's hard not to. I can't hear no cars. I can't hear no people. <laughs> Don't hear them at all. It's been our little sanctuary from life. It's gotten a little bit lighter on us. Uh, our civil cases come to an end for the most part. Uh, we've been at this point before where they said it was settled and done and and so that's where we are now. They say it's settled and everything's voted on and uh, we'll see. You know, I don't believe anything I hear anymore until I see it done because in this process that goes on from the moment Bobby was shot till now, we haven't gotten any answers. The only reason we've gotten any answers was from depositions. You know, his little baby is gonna be taken care of. Uh, that was a big part for us is we're looking forward to having little Lila be taken care of as much as we could. For the people that get to have a civil case where the judge doesn't say no, your civil rights weren't broken, uh, we get to find out a little more than they do, which uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It is what it is and uh, we're ready to put this chapter of civil case behind us and uh, celebrate Bobby and uh, and just, uh, I don't know. I hear me and my wife catching ourselves thinking of good times more that we had with Bobby, uh, where we would talk about him and before all the civil case was over, when we talk about the good times with Bobby, he would bring tears to our eyes every time, where now, that we think that it's over, it's like, it can bring a smile to our face. And that hasn't happened in a long time. So, I miss Bobby. There's a point where we were hoping to go to trial. We were preparing ourselves to go to trial. That was pretty scary, because every time that any of the families have been in court, it's just been about a smear campaign. And now I've had enough time to know what the hell's really going on. And I know how they're gonna tear up Bobby and chew him up and spit it out, and I'm thinking, I, I just don't know if I can do that to my Bobby. He's already lost his life, isn't that enough, so. Is that maybe a part of why you settled, because you wanted to spare Bobby? We didn't have a choice in settlement. It wasn't our decision. It was our lawyer's decision. By signing the, my wife signing her name, saying that she'd be a part of this, we became puppets. It, that's all we've been is puppets. For the camera, these are all pictures that I had to present of my Bobby to prove that I had a relationship with my son. So that's one reason that I personally wanted to come down. It wasn't so much to pick up the check. Yeah, put these in there. I just said, I just want to be done when I walk out of here. You know, you're never going to be able to put this behind you, but at least you could put this small aspect of it behind you, because obviously you're never going to be able to put the loss of your son behind you, but at least you could get the litigation lawsuit stuff out of the way. Knowing what happened, I think, is really important for a lot of... Well, I feel like we know a part of what happened. All right, okay. well, thank All you right. guys. All right, thank you. You know, Bobby's daughter's taken care of, and that was our primary concern. Nothing could ever replace Bobby, and we can't equate what the dollar figure was of the settlement 
to his life. Otherwise, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. It's so ridiculous. Um, uh, I was looking at pictures of me and Liz before this, and people that are meeting us now don't even know who we were before February of 2012. So what do you know about this officer? Nothing. I know his name. Uh, other than that, I've spent hours upon hours upon hours on the internet trying to find a picture. Along with their check, Liz and Everett received a CD. And on that CD, for the first time in two and a half years, Liz and Everett got to see the face of the man who killed their son. Liz had spent years having nightmares about what Nicholas Stewart looked like. It turned out that her nightmares were right. It just happened so fast. I don't know if you can grab like a whole gun or just the tip there, what, what it was. It knocked me off balance. I just, I just pulled back and I, I fired at him and I saw him two times. I thought he was going to get my gun and just, just kill me. I thought he was going to get my gun and shoot. It scared, scared me to death. And yeah, fearing for your safety, fearing for my safety, I shot him and fearing for the safety of my partners. If he got my weapon, I shot him. Reached out with his right hand, you believe? Yes, sir. And grabbed the barrel of the gun? Or was it your hands? Or do you recall what it was? I don't, I don't recall, sir. It, it must have been the barrel, because I don't remember him touching my hands. Okay. But you did feel some something yes, on the uh, barrel of your gun, yes. some force on the barrel of your gun. Okay. However, none of Bobby Henning's DNA was recovered from Nicholas Stewart's gun. The one-year anniversary of the shooting of Michael Brown came and went. Communications calling. You, you, you have the police with you now. I did add it to the call that you're Hold on. Hey, hey. Yes, I'm sorry. I notified them in the call that the crew, that you were requesting a sergeant. Okay. Well, that was getting real close to Thanksgiving. Been almost two years uh, since I got arrested. Best home prize in Fall River. You know, you can't just sit around and do nothing. You know, we. I take pride in my. I take pride in Everton. You know, when you come here, it's beyond. You're not only. You're not only a customer. You become. You become a friend. So. This is what a welfare bum does. You look at what I went through with a local department. Now, you got DEA, you got everybody else there. They have more protection. Opinions like assholes, everybody's got one, but uh, I, did, I didn't see, I don't see justice. I mean, hell, he didn't beat himself up. Everybody's going to be, what the hell is this kid doing? Basically making a cellular antenna for a weather station. So short, so that's good. It works. Pretty amazing stuff. Can't DJ on it, though. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I was ready to settle in August. I was going to settle for short money to be done with it and uh, without going to court. I mean, e either way, I've, w I've won. You know, pe people think, oh, you're just doing it for the money. No, I'm not just doing it for, I'm not just doing it for the money. Uh, I'm doing it to show people that 
one person can make a difference. We've got Ferguson, we've got in, uh, Baltimore, we've got these protests all around the United States. You keep letting them get away with things and nothing will change. Here's my car, Mom. <laughs> Filled with snow. It is coming down. Come over here and say hi to your grandma. Hi, grandma. Turn on the Christmas lights. It's going to look dope. Copy. The suspect that's injured is the one that ran from 38. All right, copy that, sir. Um, and I believe uh, you, you guys have our homicide come and investigate the officer involved shootings, right? I don't know. People just don't understand. This is the... You know, we have to accept what happened because Michael's not coming back. But it sucks that this is the new normal. Yeah, the new normal sucks. I mean, it's bad enough I lost my brother, but I don't know what I'd do if I lost one of my kids. I don't see her as often now because I'm working full time, but I can just hear it in her voice. I talk to her almost every day. She's just tired. We had to step back from protesting because it was affecting her health. I told her, I said, Mom, we can't do this anymore. You, you know, your health is uh, important. We need you. And that doesn't mean that you forget them. I grieve every day for Michael. You can't function with that grief and go through a normal life because of my child. Because you're supposed to outlive your children. They're supposed to bury you. You're not supposed to bury them. Liz and Everett finally found themselves a place away from Auburn. Hey there, how are you? I'm good, how are you? When all else fails, eat cheese. That's my motto. What is that? What is that? That's, That's an, an emu egg. egg. Oh my gosh. I gotta touch Look it. At the size of that thing. Oh, I know what I'm getting you for Valentine's Day. What? I figured it out yesterday. What? <laughs> You're not telling me? No. Can you wear it? Can nope. you read it? Nope. <laughs> you must do it. Uh-oh. <laughs> The candlelight vigil. From the day we met you. From the day we met you. So I'm holding on to them because unfortunately I know there's going to be another candlelight vigil for somebody else. You know, they ask you at school to make something for your parents for Christmas. And so Bobby put a star, and what he wrote was, I wish everybody could be safe. And I never understood why Bobby put that. To my mom, from your son, happy Mom's Day. So I always have a Mama's Day card. I mean, I still shed a tear every time I come out here. There's never a time that I don't come to the shed that I don't leave here in tears, but I don't have to ball, leave here balling, or have to leave because it's too much. So I guess if people wondering how you move on, it's just, it just goes little by little, you know? One short trip at a time. Till next time. How you feeling, Everett? Today, tired. Uh, tired. I need. It's about the only thing I can think of. I want to find something funny, but I can't do it. There's no easy solution. There's no one answer. But I think at the end of the day, we have to remember what it means to be human. 
to take care of each other. Because if we take care of each other, we won't need the police. Society has reached a turning point. The question is, which way are we going to go? Frontline battlefield in our solidarity Holding on, holding strong, broken bonds, families How long, tell me, are we even free to breathe? Look around even now People cry, anarchy, misery Living in a city where dwellers grief Treat us like animals with a few policies Police meet upon us when we stand up for the things we need Calling all the warriors, stand up for your war Every year it seems we have a different social kind of issue Transparency is needed or the system is misused And the rise then ensue and your brother soon you. Stores looted, houses burning, then they're coming after you. Why our whole globe is tense? I want to sit there on the fence. See, it takes action for defense. This you all know, this you all know, praying. Take me away from here. Take me away. Citizens rising, youths dying early, scared grand jury, cops being bullies, want to try and school me, you took his life in a better place now, little brother's getting older, his questions are tougher, he's looking to the skies and he goes over the mother, he looks into her eyes and they both begin to blubber, overhead helicopters, bullets run for cover, just a day ago things were normal, no changes, now everybody walks around aiming 12 gauges, such a heck of time that we're here witnessing, no guards waiting on for the scene. It's no wonder why our mothers stay living. Life would be better if her son was still living. Damn this madness, I feel this anguish. Damn this madness, damn this madness. Take me away from here. Take me away. They have guns doesn't make them just just so fade the soul don't be scared take me away from here Third, 2016. Just got the word this morning that my good friend George Snackshack Thompson passed away. It's too early to know what happened to you, George, but I'm headed to Fall River Town Hall. Some people here wearing black. I'm wearing black. So um, these are the people that care about you, George. I would say he's probably one of the realest people you've ever met. He was real from day one. The times that I did meet, I did see him just at his restaurant. He was always warm. He was always kind. Uh, he made you feel like a friend. And uh, I want to take it out there, too. All the stuff that he's done, volunteering-wise and stuff, it's been, uh, you know, he's left a mark for sure. So, Thank you. 